Philip Clark, Veterans of Peace. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Can I go over no, now? That's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> people, are, people are veterans of peace. People are switching off as these people. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. In all honesty, the um, the Ben Griffin podcast. Yep, is one of the most is one of the most popular I've had in terms of um, well, yeah, it's been one of the most popular uh, to this day. What number was that? Number thirty odd, I think, or maybe I can't remember. It seems so long ago. Um, but we're going off track here. We're not talking about Ben. Talking about veterans of peace. Talking we about are, Phil yes. Clark. I mean, we've had we've had a conversation before. Good conversation before in in the pub. Yeah, and that that pub in Warwick, whatever it's called. It was a good conversation. I, I was drinking coke, and you were drinking. Uh, Oh, old Rosie or something like that was it? Um, one of the, one of the things that uh, you surprised me with there because when we had when I had Ben on, yep. um, we had every intention of getting onto the subject of veterans for peace. Okay, it didn't happen because we, we waffled <laughs> about everything, right? But one of the things when we were speaking to you, one of the revelations for me was veterans for peace isn't a, an organisation. Campaigning for peace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Well, I suppose the best way of it is describing it. I think the assumption is because we're called Veterans for Peace, we're just another peace campaigning group. When, in fact, we, we see ourselves more of a, of a veterans organisation first and foremost. <clears throat> and then using a, a phrase from our handbook, I suppose, is that our combined experiences, we, we've got veterans from uh, D-Day right through to... Um, the uh, modern wars that we've been fighting, using those experiences to to raise, ra- James, basically, people aren't really aware of the full costs of war. They don't really understand what war can do, what costs are there to the people, finance, the, the overall economic costs, the cultural costs and things like that. So we see our role is to raise that awareness first and foremost. And then using those experiences... I'm giving the book answer here at the moment, but we can explore anything there that um, that you find of interest. Uh, we don't think that we should be interfering in the internal affairs of other nations. In the internal affairs of other nations, okay. Invading other countries. Yeah. And finally, our um, our third aim is we we think that the arms trade is misaligned, and we would like to see the end of that arms trade, and in particular, we are against the nuclear weapons. We don't think we should possess nuclear weapons. When you say we? First off, our country. And secondly, that that wider world there, outside. Okay. Um, And I think it's worth mentioning we we don't subscribe to any political parties or um, we don't ally ourselves with any other groups because we keep our, our own independence and... We try not to accept grants or anything like that to keep up financial independence as well. So that's a very broad brush about um, how we see ourselves um, in in this country. And um, anything we do, we try to look at those those aims I was just mentioning about the uh, raising the awareness of the cost of war, uh, the intervention in other countries, and uh, and the arms trade and nuclear weapons. Okay, cool. I've, I'm learning already. Um- Oh, the first, the first of the aims. Then, what, what's the? So the first one is to raise awareness of the cost of war, right? Um, what's the raise awareness to who and and what is the purpose of that objective? Or well, what was the objective of that aim? Well, I should say. If if the public are fully aware of of how much war costs our country, our people in our country, I think our politicians would would feel less inclined to go to war. Um, if you look at recent history with Tony Blair and the the Iraq war in particular and uh, David Cameron with the what I could only call a disaster that's happened in in Libya for example um you know it's it's not just the cost as in how many how many british troops have died in those in those wars in those in those areas of operations <clears throat> but how much money have we spent and that's just purely from a selfish british perspective but look at that wider picture is how many Iraqis died when we invaded Iraq? How many people in Afghanistan died because of our operations in Afghanistan? And just look at the, the utter turmoil that exists now in Syria and in Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and not countless countries, but a lot of countries around the world where 
our troops are deploying, our um, British-made armaments are being used, British expertise is being used to maintain these weapons, and it's just utterly wrong and a complete tragedy. And if we can help raise that awareness that there's no such thing as a short, glorious war, we think that maybe, just maybe, let's be a bit positive, politicians will no longer make those decisions to go to war. Um, yeah, interesting observation. Uh, yeah, interesting uh, observations. Um, the, the, you're right in saying with, with the cost of war, it's not just British troops, also civilians, money, everything, everything about it. Um, however, I think when we, we touched on this discussion when we were in the pub that time, I don't think... Uh, I don't think it's possible to. I don't think it's possible to def successfully defend a nation without having an interventionist approach. Now, that's not me saying that all the interventions we've done in the past have been for the right reasons or for decent reasons. I'm absolutely not saying that. 100 percent not. Okay. In fact, you probably hear some of my views on yeah. things like Iraq and Afghan, right? But I don't think it's it's. Uh, I don't think it's possible to defend the nation with with a non-interventionist approach. Um. So, I mean, let's look at Syria. You mentioned Syria there, with Syria being an issue um, in terms of what's going on there. What what is what is the issue with Syria at the moment? Um, in, from or well, the whole conflict there, because because what it is the reason we're there is the ISIS presence. When I say we, I'm referring to Russia, America, UK, and everyone else that's involved there. What's the issue with Syria at the moment? Well, I think. Into as a conflict, what's well, well, that's part of it. Is that we've got the United States, we've got our forces operating out there, both on the ground and in the air. We have the Turkish military on the ground and in the air. We have the Russian military and the Syrian military, <clears throat> various opposition groups, um, and then obviously that, that evil Daesh influence as well. But you know, that's seven, eight, nine, ten different warring factions with different aims and objectives. For example, um, the Turkish aims and objectives, what's that? That's more about the Kurds. What's the Russian um, objective in Syria? Maybe it's Vladimir Putin wanting to show that Russia is still a military power worldwide. Why is the United States in there? Um, well, why are they? Why do they say they're in there? Uh, I really don't know. Well, it's ISIS. It's well, Dash, that's like what they said. say, but is it... Initially, their aims were about the what's it the so-called Free Syrian Army, where David Cameron um, said in the Commons that there were seventy thousand troops waiting to be armed by the West to um, uh, to liberate the Syrian people against the Assad regime. They're no longer talking our our political leaders about regime change. Now it's about Daesh, but Daesh was created by the vacuum that was brought about because of that conflict and. You know, other countries that are involved, what some of the Iraqi mil militias are involved, you've got the Iranian influence, um, and you've got the Saudi influence, Jordan are involved. There's a multitude of nations, each with different aims and objectives, just making that place a complete and utter mess. But that's not what we're talking about. We were talking about why, why, why are we there? So, the, so the, I what, mean, what, uh, ISIS. So, uh, ISIS is an example. I mean, let's yep. go back to... Let's go back to... Um, um, uh, tax on home soil. you got... Nine eleven, you yep. got in USA. You got seven seven in the UK. So how do you, without having an intervention, interventionist approach to the to those kind of threats, um, and seven seven isn't the only one. You had a Manchester bombing yeah. as well, right? How, without an interventionist approach, do you defend against that? Well, if we didn't have an interventionist approach in the first place, would we be a target for these attacks? Uh, I suggest yes. Would we? I'm not not so those sure. specific attacks, but it's human nature of conflict. You, you, as you go down the line, I mean, look, you get nations that that don't take an active approach, that don't take a, a conventionally a conventionally <laughs> interventionist approach to things, <laughs> and still become targets themselves. Um, well, mm. well, so France famously did not take part in the Iraq War. However, they were uh, actively involved in the they're actively involved in the Syrian War. They're actively involved in the Libyan intervention as well. And, um, again, that's... I, my my opinion is that that is one of the reasons it's causing them to attack us here in the West. But 
I think you, you need to take a step back sometimes to to look at that bigger picture overall of why we got in that place, why we're in that situation that Daesh was almost allowed to um, uh, to evolve and become that this horrible, utter evil organisation that it is. And that is through that initial conflict with us in our country and obviously the Americans, French, etc., saying that they wanted Assad to go. It created a power vacuum that there was no plan or thought about what we're going to do about that. Who, you know, who believes this mythical free Syrian army of 70,000 democratic uh, Syrians who are wanting to fight and establish a, a parliamentary or presidential democracy in uh, in Syria? I don't really think anybody genuinely believes that. But it's by doing these things, it's by posturing and intervening that we're creating the situation where these evil groups will thrive and that that means our aims completely change and we forget about why i went in the first place because we completely honestly failed in that in that, in that original uh, aim and then they're almost trying to justify why they're still there so those those that overall um overarching real intention behind uh syria iraq afghan and those different things not they all had the same intention oh, they did called, d- d- different yeah, thing but, yeah. different situations yeah what what is the reason for that what is the reason that um those campaigns have gone on and we haven't been given the real truth about why they've been done so you got you know you got an example iraq we iraq q8 gulf one gulf two about oil would you agree or disagree majority um, I think there's a multitude of reasons that oil is 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 one that often people yeah. bring up, and I think there's probably something in there because, at the same time, we 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 had Saddam Hussein uh, with his evil, um, brutal dictatorship. We didn't really intervene in Zimbabwe with uh, Robert Mugabe's similarly brutal dictatorship. Mm-hmm. So was, why so was that? Well, differentiator is oil, maybe. There's the strategic interest from um, from, from from I suppose the U.S. perspective. Um, some people have suggested it was revenge because um, um, finishing the job that George Bush Sr. didn't do, uh, George, his son George W. Bush decided to finish it, or there's the alleged, um, I seem to remember that there was some Saddam Hussein-sponsored attempts to, to, to kill um, George H.W. Bush. Um, so was it just for revenge? Um, was it the various people different ideologies in the United States who got into positions of power thinking that by having a very over interventionist policy they could well they're talking about establishing a beacon of democracy in the Middle East so the, there's a whole multitude of factors uh, why, so why um, why why did we follow and go into war no or, no or no, no but okay. so so why would it be of benefit to USA and for the UK to follow suit to take control or have control over that those oil resources there have a strategic uh yeah, geographically politically economically strategic stronghold in that part of the world why would it why why would it be of benefit there i seem to re- i seem to remember um at the time of the uh, inquiry post war in iraq and tony blair was quite insistent that iraq was merely a step on to the the real aim was about the influence of what they saw as Iran in the Middle East. Um, and maybe they were looking at how they can protect their I find it a bit strange that we live in a we live in a democracy. We have faults in our democracy, that it's not perfect, but we live in one of the freest countries in the world, a, 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 a democratic regime. There's lots of people who live in under horrible murderous dictatorships. And I find it quite surreal at times that we here in Britain or people in the States or Canada and etc. We're supporting regimes like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates and to a certain extent Pakistan and places like that that these are brutal evil dictatorships that we are designed to support one against another because somebody somewhere within our government, civil service, military sees an overall strategic objective we need to keep the oil therefore we need to make sure that iraq is on our side iran is not going to intervene and become dominant we keep the peace with saudi arabia because of its amount of oil but why do we need to do that so why why do we need why do we need to do that we don't why why not what happens if we don't Um, What what happens if we don't what happens if we don't keep on keep on top of our resources and things that make us stronger as a as a nation and more and uh, yeah, stronger and, and less uh, less susceptible to attack. 
for starters... And when I say attack, I don't just mean conventional. I mean multitude well, of ways. Economical, m- political. My, my own assessment is that we are not under threat from any other nation from, a, from an overt attack. No one's waiting uh, to storm our beaches and to invade our country. I don't. That is not a threat. It's not been a threat for years, and I don't foresee that as a threat for a very, very, very long time, centuries almost. So we look at there's some terror attacks happening, but as I said earlier, I think if we weren't so militaristic and interventionist around the world, we wouldn't motivate people to be angry and attack us. Um, we're one of the most militaristic societies in the world. There's very, very few countries we've never invaded. Um, perhaps I should have prepared better for, these, uh, for this and brought along a book with all the countries we've ever invaded, and there's about five or six we've never invaded. Yeah, but well, that's not down to the fact that we're a nation of wankers. That's down to the, <laughs> fa- <laughs> that's down to the fact that we that, that was evolution and the way we evolved. We were very prosperous. I'm going to say we in the UK, very prosperous, and, you know, yeah, we were, we were crusading crazy badasses, right? And we took over a lot of the world. Um, but a lot of good came from it as well. But yeah, I'm not. It was good and bad, right? And we are where we are now. The reason I'm asking why, um, why, I, why, it, why is a benefit to us to you know to have control of, of oil resources to get strategic strong points in certain areas yeah. and try and keep all of those is because in the grand scheme of things at the top end, it's an interventionist approach at the very top end. And when we're talking about war. As in, as you said, an overt attack. So we're talking conventional, flipping, be that nuclear or be that small arms attack, armies, right? That's the very last, that is the very last, that's the very last thing that uh, a nation will resort to to achieve what they need to achieve to keep their country prosperous. The very first thing is politics. That's what they do between them between politics and e- e- economics that's how they do it that's why all this drama is going on with china with russia with the usa this that's what it all is it's all about that and trying to control different areas right when uh, same with the oil so uh, the oil in the long term is just an, you aim, we're aiming off because oil is going to become a very very valuable resource usa is sitting on flipping billions if not trillions of barrels out but there. do we need oil? look at the extinction rebellion uh, that's recently occurred Look at what, sorry? The Extinction Rebellion that's occurred, the um, um, the protests recently in London, stopping mm. all the traffic. and the, You know, we need, to, we need to make difficult decisions now so we don't have that dependency on oil. I, I absolutely agree. Now we, the pro- by uh, weaning ourselves off it sooner rather than later, that would mean we don't need to intervene in the Middle East. It's a complete and utter a disaster whenever we, whenever we intervene there. I absolutely agree about the oil. The problem, the problem is what you're saying. And... Uh, this isn't. A, this is a discussion, right? And yeah. I am. Um, I. I'll be compl- completely honest. <laughs> I, I, came, I came in here earlier walking the student, and I. I let my head right. Right. Uh, basically, my head was going to be an arg- argument. You know, I, I. I don't have that attitude normally. So I sit here, you know, sit down. And I thought, right, no, open mind, like you always yep, do. The that's point. the best so, way. Yeah, completely open. So mind, an open right? discussion. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, the problem with the oil is. Uh, so we're talking about climate change and all the rest of it, yep. like fossil fuels, yep. right? That's that's great. Trying to change things. We need to do it worldwide within like 25 years, 30 years. It's a huge issue. We can do it. London, maybe. Uh, UK, maybe. USA, maybe. Maybe not in that timeline. The rest of the world are going to follow suit. Oil, whether we like it or not, is going to be a valuable resource. And the whole con- the whole world knows it, right? So where you've got three big players, three, four, three really, it's not as... You got USA, you got China, you got Russia. Well, you got Vene- all... Venezuela's got the largest oil deposits in no, the world. I, want oil. Nigeria. I don't mean oil. I mean, I mean like superpowers. Oh, cons- like. consumerism and like, things like that. Like just it. superpowers, right? Yeah, so okay. that's way over. Like I was saying, he, he, at the top end, it's when you when you when we're battling, it's political and economical battles. The very last resort is is military, but you have to be aiming off for that. Why do we need to battle? Why don't we? Why can't we agree and talk and get on? Because we have different cultures, different names and intentions, and we have different resources at hand. There's a reason why Africa, in by in by and large, is a much more is a much poorer continent than Europe is, than North America is, than European main uh, than uh, than, yeah, than the, the parts of India. Because they people. don't have what we have. But, so uh, how how can, people are going to get pissed off? Nations are going to get pissed off. You can't get rid of the conflict. It's going to happen. Well, so we, need to, we need to manage people's expectations. We need to. People need to understand that. Um, you know, ultimately, what I'm struggling to find in the 21st century, 
what war has achieved that has benefited us. It's our intervention, and especially like our interventions, been a complete and utter disaster. In the 21st and, century? Yeah, 21st century. That, the that achievement was, in the 20th? Well, our, our, our aim is about the 21st <laughs> century. Okay. And we talk about uh, the conflicts that have happened in recent years and trying to prevent them happening in future years. As I said, using that experience that we've had in um, in different conflicts over the years. And and so, and, and that's it. He said, we don't need to go to war. That's fundamentally my belief and my, my, my uh, friends and, and colleagues in Veterans for Peace is we don't need to go to war to achieve these things. We can we can talk, we can discuss, we should be more sharing and open. And, you know, it uh, might seem a bit uh, basic, but nicer to each other. Start with that, uh, start with the, with the stance that, right, we want to agree, let's try to find things we can agree on first rather than what seems to happen uh, is our various political leaders in recent years have thought war is the way forward. And if you look back in history, this idea of a short, glorious war uh, has been there to, to bolster people's popularity and um, and make them look better in front of their people, particularly <laughs> dictatorships and things. And And if we step back and have that approach... I think our influence throughout the world, and those, you know, some of the British ideals about, you know, fairness, transparency, and, and justice, free, fair justice, we can use that influence in a kinder, more gentle way rather than trying to impose through warfare. 21st century has been a cluster of, of uh, clusterfuck, of, um, of conflicts, I agree. Yeah, I probably agree with that, uh, that description. I agree, yeah. right. Um, I can't, I, I, I don't really understand. Um, I. I Afghans are an odd one to try and work out really what behind what behind the behind the curtain reason for that was. Iraq's obvious, Libya's obvious, um, you know, uh, Syria. I think um, is a valid one, uh, and and you you know yes, there's a lot of nations in there doing what they they're trying to do all against the same enemy, right? Um, but I think it needs to be done there. Uh, but it doesn't mean I think that it that it's achievable it's a, it's a, a peaceful world is achievable i don't think it's it's just not possible it's just not other i think we would have achieved it over all these thousands of years by now I, it's just not i can't see it i, I ha, so well, the situation we're in now right in fact no let's 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 rewind to um let's rewind to 2001 yep i was in the ink call then transferring to the medical corps okay cool 911 yep well what caused it? Wow, what caused that? Um, lots of books and lots of theories about that, isn't there? Um, Hatred of the United States by a group of people who thought they could then maybe start a, a, Why, a war. So who were the group of people? Um, is that, that was carried out by Al-Qaeda Al with Osama bin Laden is the, the name person, the, the, the leader of that grouping at the time. And... Um, but again, if you look at the run-up to that, there've been lots of um, lots of attacks between the well, the United States carrying out attacks in countries, bombing countries. They uh, carried out bombings of Libya, they intervened in Lebanon. There was the inter um, um, where else? Oh, the how what happened in Somalia and all these all these countries where again failed interventions resulted in things being worse and the and the indiscriminate bombings that were carried out there's I struggle to understand things this would talk about precision was, bombing and things but it like was that. going both ways it was going both ways to the 80s and the 90s and I mean Al-Qaeda for example born out of the Mujahideen as you know it was yeah, yeah. yeah we, so we, we, tra we trained yeah, right. on them didn't we exactly I mean, yeah, but it's that short termism as well that um, you know was it Winston Churchill coined the phrase that he'd do the, a deal with the devil if they'd help him against Hitler or something and right. You know, uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend, etc. And that's the, this is short-term outlook, particularly if you look in, in Libya, for example, where um, our country armed and provided supplies and support to who they thought were the opposition against Gaddafi in Libya, but then they turned around and were pro possibly involved in the bombing in, in Manchester, for example, who perhaps people we'd supported against uh, Gaddafi. So it's... We don't understand these cultures properly. We don't understand how these countries work and what their aims are. And for that short-term headline, going back to this idea that some of our leaders want these short, glorious wars, 
they don't think about the consequences. I think Iraq is a is a prime example of where they didn't plan of what was going to happen afterwards, or if they did plan. It was no, a complete, no. I, I, again, garbage. I, again, listen. Again, I yeah. I, I agree with you on those things. I I agree with you on Iraq. Uh, well, yeah, I agree with you on Libya. I agree with you short term things. I completely agree that most of them have been absolute bollocks. What I'm saying is, I don't think it's possible to be able to defend the nation without an interventionist approach. Name me one of the name me name me no one of the one of the superpowers that doesn't have an intervention. Well, one of the big big players that doesn't have an interventionist approach. Mm, define big power. Um, what's a big power? So one could say that the United States is the only superpower, and they've got a very much an interventionist approach. I think. Now, who doesn't? Who doesn't have? Who one? doesn't? Well, the Republic of Ireland, Sweden, big. Norway. They're big. Norway's a big economic power, very very wealthy country. They got very little to lose because they were aligned with. So, what about China, Russia? Are they interventionist. Uh, yes, they are. Yeah. So why should we follow that path that they set? Why don't we do our own path and set a superb example to the rest of the world? That because well, yeah, you can you can set the example. But the problem is that with the three of us, the three fucking three of us, <laughs> not American. The problem is that the USA. Um, I'll say us with the UK aligned with China and, and, and Russia. They all are suspicious of each other, as as they should be. As they should okay. be, one hundred percent. Completely different names and intentions. I spoke about it before. We we are told we're right. What we're doing is right. Russia are complete knobheads, and China are flipping mental, right? And I put that nicely. They get told the same thing. So they we're do, all yeah. they're all like yeah. we're all equally yeah. wrong, all equally right. Okay, but you we can't make each other see the same perception. This, why, so why, we can't why, from the same point of view. Why, why can't we? Because I'm not Chinese, I didn't grow up there, and I'm not part of the hundreds and hundreds of years of culture. It's impossible for me to fully understand the Chinese culture. Impossible. Well, perhaps we should try. I'm just. Uh, maybe, no, no, maybe absolutely. More, more I'm, willing, yeah. I'm willing to try. I started learning Chinese last week. All right. True good. story. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to learn Latin, but that's probably not much news these days. I say, Russia, the point they're making, you can't, you can't sit back in your laurels when, 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 when other players are not. Because what happens is they grow stronger, you grow weaker. And when push comes to shove and the crunch comes, when resources become less, oil being an example, or, um, or well, yeah, oil being a prime example, you, you're on the back foot. I and di- all of a sudden, I, your well, nation's suffering. I disagree with that. I think that if we took a different course, we put our resources into different areas, for example, what's the, what's the defence budget at the moment? 2% of budget, and one of them's uh, recently who's looking to be the next Prime Minister is saying we should increase that. But, you know, if we spent that money in other areas, for example, if we spent it on green energy, solar energy, etc., we invested, rather than the research and development into nuclear weapons and to weapons of mass destruction, if we put that into, into the green industries, the food industries, to me that's a far more positive statement than saying, look, if you didn't invest all your money in weapons, and there's research to say that the... Yes, research and development into weapons does increase technology, etc., but it's exceptionally expensive. It's far cheaper to invest in civilian projects, and you get just the same sort of de- technological development, it's, but it is at a far cheaper cost. And, you know, that investment would enable us not to rely so much on all these other overseas resources that, we, we, that people talk about. And we could share these technologies so other people don't need to go to war. We could set an example by showing um, our freedom and fairness and actually not intervening and not fighting. And that, to me, would be a really powerful example to the people around the world. And, in my opinion, would encourage the government or future governments in in these other countries to adopt a less interventionist approach. Because if you look at the United States now with the... Um, the Democrats now, cont- various Democrats contended to be the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. There's quite a number of them there who are going for a non interventionist approach and to scale back the military spending. They spend vast amounts of money. What is it? They spend where, where is this? the United States. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they spend, was it? They outspend all the other top 10 military powers combined together and more. And that's a vast amount of resources going on to what I would say an inefficient. Uh, use of resources and there's far better ways of spending that money using that using that exceptional engineering skill the exceptional scientific and technology skills people have got and use those for peaceful means although having said that 
There's also um, um, Ron Paul and his son Ran Paul. Have you heard of those Republicans? Ron Paul. Ron Is Paul. Is he not a porn star? Who? Ron Paul. Senator Ron. Paul Rand. Oh, no. who's, who's the who's the gentleman know. of the old Ron Ron no. Jeremy? No, I don't know. Sorry, I haven't got a clue <laughs> on that one. Go on, go on. But these are Repu- <laughs> these are Republicans. So there is Republicans in the states who are arguing about that non-interventionist policy and not having such a massive military. And, and so it's 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 yes, most of them are Democrats. Well, there's some Republicans that that are also uh, following that as well. So. I think actually the groundswell of opinion is slowly changing about that intervention. It's because people are looking at these, the wars in the 21st century, and as you say, they've been a complete utter bollocks and disaster, haven't they? And how many lives have, have been lost in the uh, in the Iraq War? Yeah, but it's not to say we want, it's not to say what we need in the future. I mean, come back to the UK. So what's the what what do, what did you ball part the UK defence budget at? And I won't hold you to it because I don't know either. But yeah. but two but two what billion did you say? Um, we spend about two percent of our two uh, percent, two percent, um, and that's the, the and if we if we just halve that, it's, it's like forty billion or something. How do we 2%. defend ourselves if we halve that budget? Bearing in mind the size of the British forces okay. now, I mean, bearing in mind the size of the British <laughs> army, <right? laughs> part of which is recognition we which can't is recruit. arguably we can't defend ourselves now. So <laughs> how, how have we got any hope to defend ourselves? You half that budget. Well, first of all, you have to take a strategic look of what are you defending yourself against. Mm-hmm. What is the military for? And I suppose. Maybe get another Veterans of Peace plug in here. We're not a pacifist organisation. We don't believe in scrapping the armed forces. Why not? If, uh, if, non-intervention, a, if non-interventionism is, is possible, why, why would you need a military if, it's, if we, that's not possible? We believe at this moment in time we have an inherent right to defend ourselves. We won't need to if, you, if being, being non-interventionist is possible. That may be far, far in the future, but until that, <laughs> until that time, we yeah. believe there's an inherent right to defend yourselves. Mm-hmm. Okay. But having said that, what strategic um, enemy have we got that's going to be invading um, our country? I can't really think of any. I don't think France are ready to invade us this year or in the future years. But it, but the thing is, here is that warfare does not come just by, especially in this day and age, the the conventional sense of warfare and 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 beating and weakening a, uh, an enemy is not the only option no is not simply by putting troops on shores look at look at china china are arguably one of the most interventionist interventionist and um and of an and offensive uh countries in the world at the moment arguably and the majority is done by electronic warfare they're also gearing up for space warfare it, it's the, what they're doing to 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 increase their defense Unoffensive capability is massive. It's just not putting troops on, on, on uh, over borders. So why do we need military people to engage in su- defending our country from cyber attacks? Why can't we have civilians doing it? Because that's the last resort if everything else doesn't work. No, you don't. You don't yeah, need, it absolutely you, you, is. You, you it, abso- it absolutely you, is. You don't need a person in a uniform to sit against at a computer uh, to to um, defend ourselves against cyber attacks. No, but you, can you can't take o- you can't you can't take over a nation if you haven't got boots on the ground. Well, not possible. We don't want to take over another nation. So no, we, we don't. don't. Need, we don't need no, that many don't. boots on the ground. No, we don't. It's all about de- yeah. I'm about defence. But there are, there's nobody there lining up to put their boots on our ground, so to speak. I can't think of anything in the near or far future with that. So no, yeah, I mean, but if but you if, look if at we had a purely defensive force and had that neutral posture without inter- intervening. We wouldn't need to spend so much money. It wouldn't cost the forty whatever billion pounds. It will cost plus the extra cost for the for that nuclear, uh, the, those nuclear submarines. Doesn't cost that much to defend our islands if if we're looking at it from that perspective. If we go for a non-interventionist foreign policy, if we go for a non-interventionist defence policy, policy that's purely designed to defend our country, at our country. And we haven't got enough troops to do that now. And again, I, I, think, I go back I think, to I think you need to have an interventionist approach. I mean, looking at the the sort of short to mid term, arguably, we're in, arguably we're entering into another era, and, and we're on the verge of entering another Cold War. Arguably, with what's going on between the states and 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 China, for example, the sanctions that going on. It's uh, I mean, if you listen to reportedly what um, military strategists, nuclear strategists are saying. We're closer now to a nuclear war than we have been in the last thirty, forty years. So we we and 
we're in a position now which is frightening. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example, okay? Okay. I'm gonna okay. Be, you probably you might have heard this because I, I think I mentioned the podcast, right? right? And this is a fact. Now you know not to believe everything you read in the news. Absolutely you know that, right? <laughs> I'll well, give you a, I'll give you some first hand inf- I'll give you some first hand information, yeah. I'll rephrase it, I'll give you some second hand information, yeah. Okay. So you can't think of anyone that are you know looking to break down a door on a tag us. Uh Syria. Russians fighting American and UK troops. Are you aware of that? As in Russian yes. forces engaged yes. with UK and American troops yes, fighting the, 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 directly the, small arms the, against each other. There is meant to, and tanks, actually, yeah. on the Russian side, and tanks. There's meant to be some sort of grouping that makes sure that the Russians and the Americans aren't shooting at each other, but in the fog of war... We all know what happens that these sorts of things don't work. Yeah, there are, and that is one of the problems why so many interve- so many military military forces in Syria. That sort of thing is bound to happen, which makes it even more imperative that we, we withdraw our ground troops and we withdraw our um, but that's not, air assets that, as that, well. That that's not a case of so that that battle that actually happened. It's okay. happened a couple of times, hasn't it? Uh, the one the one major <laughs> one I know of. The one yeah. major one I know of. I don't I don't know. Um, Deals of any other one, so that is not simply a case of um, wrong place, wrong time. Oops, we stumble in here. We're going to start brassing you up. Oh, it's the Americans. Oh, it's the British. Oh, it's the Russians. They stop. It was a full, full blown, full blown battle, and the fact that it happened in Syria, that doesn't mean that the Syrian com- it's because of the Syrian conflict. That is an indicator. So that British, I'm going to say it again: American and British forces fight in Russian forces. When I say small arms for people listening who are civilians, that means rifles, that means flipping rocket launchers, that means machine guns. And on the Russian side, it meant tanks in the particular one I'm talking about. And there's a possibility each side can call in air support as well, whether it be helicopter, absolutely. drone, absolutely. Or, or, or so the, or this is something bombs. that happened and recently. I'll leave it at that. So recently. Um, that's, that's Russia versus... That's East versus West, right? happening and being kept under the radar which to me is absolutely fucking frightening absolutely well, frightening one of the so, costs of war is that lack of transparency that those that information that people need so they can make sensible choices ultimately the ballot box but it, but again going back so the, the interventionist thing it's it's an example of why you can't you can't be you can't decide as a as who we are right Norway, yes, for example. Falklands, yeah. Let's just have a defence force, you know, and that's it. We can sit back because they're not a valuable. There's nothing. They're not a threat to other nations. They're not. Who are the Falklands threatening? Who are the Norway threatening? Who is Sweden threatening? No one. UK is a big player in, in, in finance and politics. Same as USA. Same as Russia. Same as China. Which is all. Which is why we're all flipping battling. To take a sit for the UK to take a step back and sit down and go. And let's say it's let's say it's over thirty, forty, fifty years, and you gradually bring it in, Phil. It still compromises us because I, I everyone else is in the same position. Does, I, I, my assessment is is the reverse. I think if we took that non-interventionist approach, we could become the honest broker. We could be a powerful honest broker to try to bring those warring sides together, because they could see we have no strategic interest in these wars, in, in intervening overtly or covertly, because we're taking a Maybe it's taking a high moral ground and saying war is wrong. We should not be fighting. Let's get you together to start discussing, and then let's talk about what you agree with, and then find more things you agree with, and more and more, until it eventually becomes a crescendo. And you know what? Those things we disagreed with. Let's focus on the things we've agreed agreed to. And that, to me, is far more powerful than intervening. And when you look at the, out the, um, the 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 I don't know the battle readiness, the preparedness, and the the, the the scale of our forces and the equipment etc it pales into insignificance when you compare it to the United States so actually some people argue that one of the reasons we do intervene with the United States is to try to rein them back try to get the United States not to be as militaristic and gun ho as uh, as perhaps we expect them to be but I, I think that that's just a false argument it just doesn't hold any validity because experience has shown that that's not happened and we're just as gun ho and unfortunately, as uh, as our partners in these uh, in these wars recently, well, well, we're, we're allies, right? So, I mean, you, you, strength and uh, uh, a nation's strength isn't just solely its 
you know, military strength. It's, like I said, political, economic, or... So, so, so yeah. cultural, the English so, language, the, so, the film, so we the culture, to, the music, and yeah, the abs- arts absolutely. is all is all part of that. And that's and all those, to me, those are the things we should be investing in more to show what a beacon the United Kingdom is. I think I, just, I don't think I I, it, I just I'm a bit don't too think idealistic. I'm do you think? No, I absolutely listen. Listen, what you're saying would be amazing, absolutely amazing. The situation we're at the minute, not possible. It's not. It's we, not. It's not possible. We remain hopeful with a long-term outlook. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're step by step by step. You know, I, I, um, maybe bring some of my experience in uh, the uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland. Look at look at look at how it's Shin- a good subject. Well, timely. Look, look, timely. Look, look at look, look at how how Sinn Fein adopted their strategy. Little step at a time until they can achieve things. Well, actually, perhaps we should learn from Sinn Fein. I don't believe I'm saying this now, but you know, it's take it little steps at a time. First step, let's bring all our nuclear weapons into base. We're not deploying them anymore. Second step, let's get rid of them. Third step, let's reduce the amount of people who want in our armed forces. Fourth step, let's get rid of these silly aircraft carriers and these power protection and these, um, you know, to make our our defence staff look even more manly and powerful because they've got big ships to stand on. But if you and do bring those all things. those things back and spend the money on other issues, on other things... What a what a powerful example! Absolutely, that would be. but you're relying on every other leader of every other nation to be just as honest and and well intentioned as us, and it's not the case. I'll give you a, a prime example: North Korea, raining. Imagine if we rain on nuclear weapons. USA rains on nuclear. New weapons are gone. Guess who's not doing it? Kim Jong flipping mental pants over in North Korea. It's not happening. And then all he sees is well, there's no deterrent now. For me to be a nutter, but and then who's who? Y- who know, who's got the the, but the strongest the military then. capability right. on the planet? But I'd ask you North the question Korea. then: Is actually what is their capability? And then looking at back at, uh, at the Iraq, what was it? Saddam Hussein apparently within forty-five minutes can uh, bomb the United Kingdom, so it's a clear and present threat that Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell and these other Labour people said at the time. Complete. Am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah. Complete utter bollocks. I mm-hmm. do apologise. This is Iraq. Yeah. yeah. What about and, and, um, and Korea as well? They are, about, they've got absolutely no strategic or tactical threat to us in our country. Not one. Do you, how do you know that? I'm not saying. Well, I'm not saying 100. How, 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 how many miles away are they? What, what, Can, about, what about? Are they going to fire a nuclear missile <laughs> over the over Russia, over Ukraine, Germany, France, etc., to attack the United Kingdom? Probably not. No, there but you I go. Think, They're um, not a threat to us. Hawaii's in range to them, isn't it? Hawaii's and Hawaii, American, Americans, and I like. But let's take. I, but if, 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 if the United States had a defence policy rather than an attack up war policy, actually they could invest their um, capabilities in the satellite to track it and their anti missile capabilities. They and have Hawaii's an, an awful long way from North Korea and. Even if North Korea fired all its missiles in one go, they would barely get away from the North Korean peninsula with the defensive weapons they've got. So I don't see North Korea as a threat. So why, but on that point, why would you wait for it to get to that stage of pulling the trigger? Which is why you've got all the stepping up of the um, sanctions and the, and the, uh, that's like the propaganda then, and the, the threats against North Korea by America and arguably us. But, well, because why wait for the trigger to be pulled? Why, 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 why are they doing it? I think, in some respects, you look at what Donald Trump's do, trying talking with um, Kim Jong Un. Is that how you say it? Yeah, I'm, Kim, not, I'm, I'm, Kim I'm u- yeah. useless at pronouncing foreign names and stuff. I do apologise. And you know, he's trying to talk with people, and that talking to me, and you've got to look at the the motives of the people in the State Department, and look at John Bolton, who's got his national security visor. And look at what's happening with um, some of the senior United States military people. We need to change their mentality from rather than one of power projection, aren't we strong and powerful, to taking that step back saying we don't need to intervene. We could, other ways we can encourage people by economic development and things like that. And to, again, go back, I think that, that peaceful way, that non-militaristic way, and getting away from that old militaristic society that we live in, our society is full of militarism that encourages that sort of offensive posturing and, and intervention. But you make out like it's the first option that we go for 
when I you make out like it's such it's not the first well, time. Unfortunately, it is. Our recent wars have shown it. It's not. It's it, not. So it, Iraq. It, it's not. So just sorry. Just okay. just two seconds. So Iraq, for example. Yep. Okay. It's it's the same mirror image thing that happens every time. Now, so it goes from political, economical, as in the the the, the threats and the uh, impact you have in sanctions. What right? threat was Iraq against us? When? Why we invaded it? There was no reason for us to invade. There was no reason for the United States to invade Iraq. So the second and Gulf two, when we, two. We, when we yeah. invaded it, yeah. Well, go back to oil resources, strategic importance. Well, we didn't need to. I don't believe we did need to because we couldn't. We at the time we had more re, our own resource in the North Sea, and it was a time when we could have made a decision to go more for green energy rather than reliant on the fossil fuels. So I don't believe there was any reason why we needed, why we had to evade Iraq. But was the invasion the first option that we went for? Yes. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. What other options were it was, there? It was political threats, it was sanctions, they tried to, un- they tried to unroot Saddam Hussein, they did all of that, and then the last option was invasion. North Korea, again. Were the milli- just- million plus lives worth it? No, but the point we were on yeah. is, the point we were discussing is, the See, military I- option is not the first option we take. I don't, I, I, it's the last. I don't believe that was the ever. I think military option was the first foremost option when it came to Iraq. Iraq was not... It, at the time, people were saying in the United States and some people here in the UK that Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11. They were not involved whatsoever. The intelligence that they found to say they were trying to find uranium, was, you know, they call it fake news now, don't they? It was fake. It was made up mm-hmm. to try to justify. I agree with you. The biological weapons capabilities that, uh, unfortunately, what's his name, Powell, Colin Powell was showing off at the UN. Complete fake. It was all fake to justify an invasion of Iraq because George Bush wanted to invade Iraq and Tony Blair wanted to be George Bush's best friend. They were the there last. There was so. no, I don't think there was any real attempt to resolve differences. In fact, it was also the created differences <clears throat> in order to give excuses to invade Iraq. There was no reason whatsoever to invade Iraq. No, but the point, I'll go back to the point again. The military option was not the first option. As soon the, the WMD side of things and all the bullshit and came about as soon as they decided, right, we've got another option here, but to invade, to get Saddam Hussein or to get that country to do what we want. When I say we mean the Allies, and when I say do what we want, I'm not saying that's for wholly honest purposes, as I discussed, right? What I'm saying is military option isn't the first option. I'll go back to North Korea. North, which is probably the most pertinent at the minute. North Korea, there's going to be a conflict. I, I can't because of the way Kim Jong Un is, Kim Jong Un is, Un is, and the way it's gone pear shit with USA talking to them. I can't see it going anywhere else. But um, it, now it probably nothing will probably happen. Kim Jong Un will probably stand down. But but my point is that as an example, there's been political uh, political attempts. There's been sanctions being made. There's been threats flipping thrown about left right in chelsea even on twitter obviously by uh <laughs> by um trump you know it, if, if, our next war, the military, if our next war is fought on, on if our next war is fought on twitter that really doesn't no. perhaps that's the best way but but to say I, our I, first option is a military option is wrong it's what, just not the case why should they we, even try to assassinate saddam hussein before we invaded they even tried to assassinate him they couldn't get anywhere near him which is well again it goes back to we shouldn't be intervening in the internal affairs of the nations there was no strategic reason Iraq was absolutely no threat to our country. North Korea is absolutely no threat to our country. We're a small island off Europe. We should recognise that. Um, why do we need to be militaristic and be a world power? I don't think we do. No, but you have to remember that North Korea made threats towards the USA, which is where they came about. But why should and we before, be And before in that? that, and before that, those threats came about from Kim Jong Un and, and his dad, Kim Jong Il, was it? So the threats yep. came towards the USA, and those threats are born out of criticism from the USA and the UK and other countries because North because of the dictatorship being run by North Korea and the state of the people living there and the conditions they're living in. There was no military threat made to them. It was, oh, like North Korea, you're being flipping nutters. And then North Korea turned around and said, oh, we're going to bomb the shit out of you. You, you, should all, you should all be destroyed. Well, they have Words to that effect. And have we invaded? Um, but we... we should not be involved at all in North Korea. Leave that to the United States. But if we provide an example to the United States that 
militarism, warfare should be off the table completely, I think it'd be completely it'd be different discussions. We should be looking at more opening up to them. We should be looking at economic investment to them. We should be looking at ensuring our broadcasts in the, uh, even by the BBC World Service and others, and people in that country get the information. But we, we can't resolve it by invading them. And that's what it seems to be building up to. And it's like uh, <coughs> recently in, in, in um, Iran with um, the senior British general, um, whose name escapes me, has basically said Iran's not really a threat. But the Americans turned around and said, well, he is, shut up. But what a threat is Iran to us? None. We are... One, we should not be a world power. That's just wrong in this modern day and age. We, we've been UK. Yeah. I don't think that... We should not have that offensive capability to go and intervene in other countries around the world. That, to me, is fundamentally wrong. Our armed forces should be here just to protect our country from attacks to our country. And the level of the armed forces, I would suggest, will be relatively low because there are no threats to our country. Military threats. No one's lining up to invade us. Not North Korea. Not Iran. Not Syria. Libya. And all these countries. They're not a threat to us. So we don't need a military we, we, to go and deploy massive aircraft carriers laden with bombs to go and kill innocent Iranians when we start bombing them, if we do. And that, to me, is, there's no justification for it. There's no strategic reason why we need to be involved in these things. We should be focusing our money, our expertise, our country's good aspects on showing the world there's a better way, that we're an honest broker. Imagine if we were, we had a non-interventionist policy. We scaled back our military. We focused on um, our culture, our economy, finance, the arts, etc. With Iran and the United States arguing against each other, we would be an honest broker there. We could try, and again, going silly, they could discuss what's the differences between them. So... I only see that as positive if we have that non-interventionist policy. And if we did achieve those aims, you know, again, how many people died in Iraq, how many people died in Afghanistan, Libya, etc. What are the ongoing problems in Libya? It's utter, utter nightmare. And, and the current ones, depending on when people are listening to this podcast, what's happening in Yemen? It's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. There are, what strategic reasons are we supplying Saudi Arabia with arms? Our military forces are out there. The def one of the defence ministers recently admitted that our special forces are operating on the ground in Yemen. RAF personnel are in Saudi Arabia training and potentially in the control rooms for the Saudi Air Force. We have British technicians there fixing the planes. Are they fixing the weapon systems? Are they, load are they loading the bombs that are then being used to bomb Yemen? And on the other side, we've got our international aid. It's being sent out to Yemen to fix the problems we're causing by bombing your men. It just seems utterly ridiculous. Yeah, the There's the whole tragedy of people dying that's just unimaginable. But the, but the and then there's the perverse, almost comedic element is, one minute we're bombing, the next we give him some food and some bricks to rebuild the house so we can bomb it again. It's just utterly... I just can't get my head around what well, we're doing Well, that's the generation. I mean, the problem is with it is as well, Phil, is that... Um, the military, with the military side, it's just a just a piece of the puzzle. I mean, the Saudi Arabia involvement, the the impact in Yemen. Um, I mean, that is a, a part of maintaining a, a a a relationship that is beneficial to us in a in a, well, in, a, in, a in a plethora of ways. We'll agree to differ. We'll agree to differ. Well, no, that. otherwise, otherwise, because this is the thing. Okay, if it wasn't beneficial to the UK as a nation to sell Saudi Arabia arms or maintain other. Relationships of some way, shape, or form, because the military side is one side, and I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying it's right. Okay, I'm saying if it wasn't beneficial to the UK, we wouldn't be doing it. And by beneficial, and for it to be beneficial to the UK, it means it has to maintain us a certain strength or status or whatever to maintain us as a as a nation and protect the nation. Now, I'm not saying it's right. It's a bunch of different pieces of the puzzle. 
It's very, very fucking complicated. Oh, it, it is. You, <laughs> and it, I don't it, understand it. <laughs> m- m- maybe we should retire to the pub and solve the problem oh, yeah, there yeah. for a few pints. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you're right. It is exceptionally complicated. And sometimes we, we perhaps di- we, we dilute things out to very simplified facts. But I would argue that there's actually no benefit with us ha- having any alignment with the, with the Saudi government. Because, um, for example, we train various Saudi princes at Sandhurst. Okay. And uh, various other military colleges and and, and officer training uh, centres we have in the UK, and the reason we do that is so we can influence future generations, so they introduce democracy and they're nice and they follow democratic norms. But we've been training these, again, apologise about swear these murderous bastards for years, and it's not having one single iota of impact on changing their policies. Uh, who say who? We're training lots of Saudi princes who are now senior officers in the oh, yeah. military. They've been to Sanders, Cranwell, what's the Royal Naval one, Britannia, and various um, training centres throughout the UK. It's not having any effect whatsoever. How can you measure that? How, how, well, how, how, be- what are you measuring that by? Well, because the way that they are bombing Yemen, ultimately, and the way that they're carrying out bombings in Syria and the... Um, the embargo that it, Saudi it, Arabia forced the talking about Saudi and Saudi Arabia forced on Qatar. Who is Saudi bombing in Syria? They're bombing whatever targets they think they want to bomb. That's part just, of the just like we are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then it's so you know it's another you know how many how many nations I haven't got enough fingers and toes even borrowing your fingers and toes to count the many of nations that are involved in Syria. Just making a complete and anyway, I'll just uh, shout and get angry. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, Syria. You know, Putin wants that 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 winning that 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 win on his card, claim it for himself. Probably is claiming it. Trump wants it. You know, but um, Assad wants it. That's what that's all about. So you put people in there. Plus, you got Turkey, a vulnerable nation next door. I mean, look, going back. Let's go back just to um, and we'll move on if you want after that. Yeah. To the interventionist side of things, because yeah. I'm interested in what. Uh, uh, no. Let's say we let's say um you know, we 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 convince ourselves or we reduce ourselves to a defence only. Yeah. And let's say America does the same thing. How how would you then deal with a North Korea makes a threat? How should America deal with it now? I think by continuing to talk with them. Find out what do they want. And then we should also by invest investing in the country, giving people hope and opportunity. Where? In North Korea. But they're not having it, and the talk's well, broke down. I know, but you should keep talking and talking. While you're talking, you're not fighting, you're not killing each other. That's and she'll so keep these channels of communication open. And it's by it's, it's not it's not just uh, keeping the military in the background. It's about the overall um, change of the culture, change of the attitude. So we're talking. We're not going to beat you ever with military side because we think that's wrong. We're going to talk with you and discuss things with you. We're going to show you um, that we're peaceful and we don't mean harm and but you're basing it on you go i'm going to go back right which is why i think it's not possible to even get peace ever in the future right because you you it's the assumption that the other person can be as honest and as well-meaning as you and also that their perception or their opinion of what honest and well-meaning means is the same as your own it's just not the case it's just not the case we could try to convince them we could show them through our. Why, through, why should our, they? Our why should? Why should they do what we think is right? Exactly. We shouldn't intervene. In, <laughs> <laughs> we should not intervene in the internal affairs of other nations. <laughs> well, so what's the point of talking? Just go straight to. Uh, just, just go straight to invading. That's what we do anyway. Apparently. Well, yeah, we do. But <laughs> but don't. why 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 even fight and why why have conflict with them in the first place? Because people stop talking. Because they're not they're not they're absolutely no threat to us whatsoever. How did this? How did the Second World War come about? Ah, oh, that was in the twen- that was a twentieth uh, century. How did the conflict. First World War come about? People stopped talking. <laughs> People stopped doing what the other countries wanted. That's what happened. I think it was completely different times, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, you look back. What was the last? Uh, what was the last? Um, what was the last conflict you would say was was fine? Was acceptable? I don't judge any conflicts like that. I think what's happened in the past is history. And we should just learn from learn from what happened there. I don't judge anything was a just and uh, uh, and right war. I just I don't say anything. That was history. That was then. Different times yeah, existed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it, you know, to be fair, 
it gives us an opt out we don't have to discuss the rights and wrongs of those wars in the in the previous century because it's different times it's a completely different world we live in now mm -hmm. the communications are far far more effective because if you look at warfare 100 two, three, four hundred years ago yeah somebody would give an order it take three weeks to countermand that order so battles could have been won and fought in one area where people would be talking peace in another area but so it's completely different um uh, in the 21st century than we look in the uh, 20th 19th 18th etc so it's good the 21st century is good because you've got more tools to avoid war before we actually get that last stage exactly we can talk with each other we can show each other uh, and again but it goes back to the core thing is why do you want conflict with people i don't we don't i don't this is the thing i don't yeah. i think the only people who want the conflict is is the banks right they get loads of money from you. That's what I think. Okay? I thought I was wearing but, a tin hat. You got one as well. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I absolutely believe that. I, but well, but yeah, we, 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 we go, I mean, we move on. But yeah, I don't. I, but like that's a good. It's a good, good, but, good, good, perhaps a good point to finish on from that side of things. That you have got this vast military industrial complex that uh, that needs war to make money. And I think if I was I was watching this um, this morning something on Twitter about um, what's the that new senator from New York called the very liberal socialist one was questioning uh, an arms manufacturer that was supplying some sort of brake pads or whatever that cost $4,000, but they were charging $200,000 each one. Oh, my God. So it's, there is that m big industrial complex, and mm. you look at the arms fair down in the XL that's in a, in a few months' time. People do like that, and these arms companies know how to, how, how to serenade the people who control the purse strings. So that's another issue as well perhaps we can leave that to another point. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps you can get the bae systems uh, chief exec on or something to discuss yeah. that <laughs> what do you think of um what do you think about penny madont's uh, um, uh intention to pass a law that would um that would it's not excuse that would uh well, the, the 10 year the 10 year time prevent, limit, or a yeah. 10 year time that, that prevent that would prevent a so i'll, I'll that yeah. would prevent someone yeah. getting investigated for a alleged war crime or crime in battle or crime when they're serving, unless there was a significant change in circumstances. What do you think about that? I think it's it's in two parts really. That there's the because in this original bill that's been that's been published, Northern Ireland's been excluded. Yeah. But it's Northern Ireland uh, cases recently that have uh, that have really hit the news. Um. I would, we can talk about Northern Ireland if you want. Yeah, I, I, I would suggest that a, a peace and reconciliation committee <coughs> would be a far more effective uh, solution for long-term peace in, uh, in Northern Ireland because a lot of people, how many, how many people died? 3,000 plus and about 80% of these have been unsolved. So if you had a, a form of peace and reconciliation committee where people could speak truthfully without fear that what they're saying can be used against them in a court of law, I think you can get... F overall far more closure for the friends families and loved ones of the people who were killed in northern ireland than by just focusing on trying to prosecute a couple of people that's what happened with the savile inquiry though the savile inquiry was a was an inquiry and the but, aim of it was to find out what happened and that 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 information could not be used to as evidence against I, the soldiers I, I've, and where got, are I've, we at now? I've, I've got issues with the amount of money they spent on the savile it's 170 odd million wasn't it yes yeah, so, i think it's i think it's 200 it was, I think it was 200, ridiculous yeah, 200 amount million. of money uh, that was spent on it and um, whereas there's lots and lots of, of deaths and we sometimes forget that how many how many people were killed by um, by Pyra, um, Inla and all these others and yes there were people killed by um, our colleagues in Northern Ireland by the RUC as it was now the PSNI to me because a lot of these happened so many years ago most of them you will not have any evidence to prosecute people whether it be killing security force personnel whether it be killing innocent innocent people whether it be protestant catholic etc there were so many murders so many heinous crimes committed that there will, we will never solve them through the courts therefore on that issue i think we just take a step back and say peace and reconciliation committee get the truth out there and that would bring better closure for more people than perhaps one or two who might be from prosecution. But with the, I mean, but, but we're going the ten year, the ten year thing about deployments to Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. If a soldier has committed a crime, mm. they the, there needs to be an investigation. There needs to be the evidence put towards um, t put towards a jury, and then let the jury decide whether that person committed a... Uh, well, a jury, a, a, depending a crime. on the crime, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I would suggest that it's probably better in front of a jury rather than, than a court-martial. 
particularly for a lot of them will have left the military anyway in that in that time period that is fundamental we are british we believe in justice freedom fairness and that is right that it should be done however i do have very big concern that it does appear that most people who are prosecuted are the soldier pulling the trigger we don't see anybody in their chain of command similarly investigated and prosecuted because ultimately if somebody murdered uh, an enemy combatant or a civilian on the the battlefield generally what's the say is oh that person was acting in isolation they were a rogue a rogue soldier i don't believe that we need to look at how did it come that that soldier pulled the trigger and killed a civilian in afghanistan iraq etc and i don't believe we investigate their chain of command in theater we don't investigate the chain of command in the mod whether it be the civilians civil servants or whether it be the military commanders we don't investigate the politicians who make the decisions to go to war we don't investigate the politicians who make the decisions or the civil servants or the military uh, senior military people who make the decisions of what sort of training how much training people get and until we hold to account those senior people who ultimately put that soldier on the ground we shouldn't be prosecuting that soldier. We should prosecute them, but we should, at the same time we should prosecute the generals as well. Well, they are investigated, the, especially the military side, and that's how, that's how changes in the ROE and, and, and changes in the type of training and, and the way changes in, in, changing in, changes in tactics and doctrine and procedure is communicated on the ground, um, is communicated to, communicated to the troops on the ground, because when an incident like that happens, even minor, even a minor incident, um, this investigate all our levels but and that's that because that's the culture we live in now you know it's like okay that but we're very intelligent that, in terms of um in terms of realizing i say we're very intelligent compared to flipping 60 <laughs> years ago right no we, we're we're very modern and on top of it in the sense that when we see a problem on the on the ground and let's say it's a soldier shooting someone they shouldn't have shot yeah. right um then every everyone up the chain is investigated they are they, they are investigating. Oh, yeah. Why did the problem happen? Because it's so it's it's not good. It's not and I and I said the same thing to Ben. I'm very fortunate. I say I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. I feel fortunate, but it's probably the wrong way. That would describe it as if it was a rarity, which it wasn't. I never knew of any in, in all the tours I did. I did quite a few. I never knew anyone that that shot someone they shouldn't have shot. And I can say that hand on heart. And I never heard of anyone else doing it. I can say that hand on heart as well. Um, that's not to say it doesn't happen. But they do get investigated. I mean, going to the top end of the tree, white all politicians, that's a different kettle of fish. Why do you put them there in the first place? Um, what do you think about the 10-year time limit on it, on the investigation? Uh, I don't actually believe that any crime should have a time limit. Well, let's look at... Um, but they're, 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 but we, have, we clearly have in our... Um, no, in sorry. our legal system from the civil side of things so people suing the military suing individual soldiers there are time limits set in our in our civil uh, court system i don't think we need to make any changes in that and it does it does make exception for exceptional circumstances that can be investigated but the problem with it the problem I, with, I, um, I think i think it's i don't think i think the law is being brought in for the wrong reasons and it's been rushed in and i think it's been poorly thought out unfortunately politicians decide to bring in laws when they need to you know, there's a t potential Tory party leadership contest going to be going on very soon. And so I believe that a lot of the ministers are trying their best to, to, to stake their claim to being the next leader of the Tory party. And I believe this is part of that, that it's a very... Look at the Dangerous Dogs Act, completely useless. Didn't work, doesn't work at all. You look at the uh, the fox hunting that Tony Blair brought in as a sop to the left wingers in, while he was in government it's ineffective it's not really stop fox hunting so yeah, the, well, it's, 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 a bad, it's a badly rushed law it doesn't really change anything it, no, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't really change anything but, it's I mean, been going, done for political going, reasons going back to the timeline thing yeah the, the good, I, I like the timeline thing okay and I like that there's the exception in there for exceptional circumstance like in flipping 30 years time it's found out that soldier X um, shot someone that he shouldn't have shot or she shouldn't have shot and there's video of it well, in 30 years, guess what? This video of it, you're getting flipping investigated, right? But the, the problem is now, uh, sorry, the, the thing I like about the 10-year timeline thing is is it accounts for memory over time. 
So when we talk about 1972, Bloody Sunday, 1974, it was Dennis Dennis uh, Dennis Mitchens, right? He's that 77 year old. Uh, he was um, he was the I think the lifeguards, the lifeguards. Um, but don't forget, our CPS still has that uh, issue before bringing a prosecution. Is it in the public interest? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, but, and, I, and I, I don't think that ten year. I think it's. Uh, but, it just but look, doesn't quite see over forty years. We, we, so we, can we, you, we shouldn't have a statute of limitations. But without that, but so if you just rely on a memory. Which is what? Which is what? Nineteen seventy-two uh, is, is what the seventy stuff is doing. Because you have to remember, with the Savile Inquiry, right? With the Savile Inquiry, there were findings there that that they failed to sort of make the papers these days. An example being, there was IRA shooters at uh, the London Derry. There was IRA shooters. They were active and or they were it, or is it Derry? Fucking London Derry. <laughs> <laughs> it's London Derry, Derry, London. I think right? Martin McGuinness Derry, admitted that Derry. at the start of the day. Hey, Martin McGuinness was there Pi- on Pi- the day, Pyro- and armed Pi- with a f- pirate, and then. But again, you know, he, he's 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 passed away now, so he's dead. That he can't yeah. quiz him further. But so, Martin th- McGuinness is there on a day and armed. I think that the Savile Inquiry is probably not the right thing to look at because, with a statute of effectively, this is saying there's a statute of limitations. Yeah. And I don't actually, personally, I don't believe there should ever be a statute of limitations. But it makes for any exception. Crime. It's, it's, it's exceptional well, evidence, which is which is which is fine because it means that if which means that new law is complete waste of time. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't change much. But what it, it does, much. what it does change, is it means that there is, where there was an investigation in seventies and eighties, I can't remember when it was first investigated. Well, it was probably first investigated at the time, the London, uh, the Bloody Sunday example, right? When that was first investigated, and then and, and it was found that all right, people were morons, but there was dramas on both sides, and it's one of those things. Then it was investigated again, so no cry, no no charges brought to bear, right? Then it was investigated again, okay, and then it was a Savile inquiry, right? And then it's investigated a third time. What well, is not new evidence? It's just new allegations. There's not new evidence. It's just new allegations. This is the thing, and if and if you're talking about forty, what we are forty odd years ago, I don't believe you can cite someone a new witness as firm evidence over that time because of the you, you can't rely on memory over that time. When you remember something, you remember the last time you remembered it, yeah. And then you're going to go and drag up a seventy-seven year old and go. Oh. You haven't it, thought about it for thirty years, but it, do you remember this this guy saying? For, forget this. forget the Savile in Northern Ireland. When whenever historic crimes are um, are prosecuted, it is very difficult for the CPS, the prosecution authorities, to prosecute something twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years after the event. Mm-hmm. But I still, I still don't believe there should be a statute of limitations. And if if there's new evidence emerges. And I don't know enough about it to see whether there was or wasn't any new uh, new information that emerged for Savile. But I suppose I go back to what I said earlier that actually that however many mi- millions of pounds that uh, I'm sure many lawyers became very wealthy out of that. Um, how much more that money would have benefited? Uh, sorry, society would have benefited Northern Ireland far more with that amount of money being invested um, in an overall Truth and Reconciliation Committee and try to try to get that in place i think that would have been far more so i think perhaps sometimes we can look at basic things and look at individual incidents but i, I try to look at take a step back and look at it from a strategic perspective yeah, yeah. i mean the think positive better thing in a, in a long term because you know, I, I, spent, I, spent, for, um, I spent what eight nine years out there on intelligence duties seeing it from a completely different angle the vast majority of people see and you know people get the get the books about the troubles which are most vast majority of them are complete utter bullshit with the allegations they're making but and it also does seem a, a war that happened such a long time ago, doesn't it? But it wasn't well, that long ago, no, was it's, it? It's still, it's still, still going on. Look at what still ongoing. This is the thing. That little like, fortunate journalist was killed. This wasn't is she? part of the reason all this crap yeah. has gone on with uh, with, uh, this, with these allegations in the seventies. I mean, one good thing that um, the Modant suggested law will will prevent is an investigation. So an investigation will happen into a alleged crime, right? Ten fifty. 11, 15, 20 <laughs> years down the line, there won't be another ge- allegation, uh, another investigation on it purely based on public outcry, like it's happening now, oh, I, 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 without, I, without, without evidence. I, I think that that's what will prevent. When, when prosecutions are made on public outcry, we've seen again not just uh, issues that happened in Northern Ireland, but it's happened 
in lots of unfortunately lots of times in our country a public outcry encourages the police and the prosecution authorities to find anybody to prosecute and, 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 and that, that sort that sort of prosecutions based on an outcry is wrong and our, our, our prosecutors should not be looking at the court of public opinion first and yeah. foremost they should they should have the the courage of the, uh, their convictions to look at the evidence honestly to see whether uh, uh, there's a realistic chance of a prosecution and then look at the public is it in the public interest to carry out that prosecution not making any judgments about the bloody sunday and everything like that ones about whether they meet the public interest in because i don't have all the evidence in front of me but i think we should we should have confidence in our prosecution authorities to do that without any relation to public outcry but again going back to some of our political masses perhaps sometimes they've, they've allowed pr prosecution investigations to go on just to try to sop people is try to divert them from from other things that are that are occurring and going back to this bill that's been brought in it's a rush law it will be a bad law and it's as you say probably well, I, I something we agree on it's probably it's gonna, not needed I, I don't think it's gonna be negative i think it's gonna change very little but i do like the fact that 10-year clause so um unless there's substantial uh, uh significant evidence right that tenure clause means you can't discover your reinvestigation. I want to go back and just mention something as well. When we're talking about the 70s, Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland issues, I don't know. I don't know if the soldiers are innocent or guilty of what they've been accused. I don't know, okay? I do know. <laughs> I do know. I'm pretty confident I know that there's been a lot of dishonesty on both sides, all right? On both sides. Um, however, I don't believe that I don't believe that we're gonna ever gonna know what really went on because it is now that long ago and with the lack of you know we don't have the technology that we had now I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible and like you were saying the reason it's going on now is because there's there needs then for political reasons an example needs to be made of British forces that'll be one person getting done I, I believe he's gonna get done whatever he'll get sent down and that'll be a okay look Northern Ireland happy we prosecuted someone a sort of minimum pay in the UK can take and that's it unfortunately it's going to be wrong it's going to be wrong you cannot it was 40 odd flipping years ago you can't work it out you can't work it out was it 40 odd 57 oh crikey my maths is getting terrible 40 57 years ago yeah, it's a long, 57 it's a, years ago these things happened a long time ago and we, yeah. and we have to look at again we're not going to get closure on every single murder that occurred by using reliance on our prosecutors and the, and the police who investigate these so they can go to trial, which is why we need to think of different solutions to this issue to bring closure because there are lots of families out there whose loved ones died, killed, murdered, etc. during the, the Troubles and I think that some sort of truth and reconciliation would benefit more people rather than putting what limited resources they have in one or two prosecutions that may or may not result in, in, um, in, in convictions um, but yeah it's uh it's been going on an awful long time and perhaps it's best left to historians in some of these instances to decide what did and didn't happen in a couple hundred years time we have a minute left i'm glad you mentioned historian uh i want to get i want to uh special mention for um a friend of mine uh who passed away recently max arthur the military historian uh i think the uk's most successful and popular military historian um he did uh is one of his la his last book. Um, I had the pleasure of being interviewed for that, which was um, oh my god, sorry Max, pa uh, the Paris, yeah, the Paris book. So Max, yeah, he died, he died a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately. Um, I'd forget otherwise we'd have mentioned it there. Right, we got we got like a minute left, mate. I uh, I just want to say, I uh, I absolutely wish and hope we get to a position where we can have a non interventionist approach. We can chill out and not. Worry, right? So I don't think do it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> However, veterans for peace. I honest, mate. I honestly welcome the existence of the organisation because it opens discussion like this, like have a Ben. I've got a badge, of yours. I wear it on my lanyard at work, hundred percent next to my LGBT badge, and uh, and it'll stay there, mate. I, because it's uh, you're good, honest people, and, I, and I, it's 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 good to have these discussions. Yeah, I've enjoyed having a good good discussion with you, and. Um I'm sure we'll catch up again sometime because well, I do a bit of work here. Veterans of Peace, how do people how do people take a look at what it's all about? Um, basic thing, vfpuk.org, and that's got links to all our articles. And um, if you want to join us, please join us. 
and it's got links to all our various social media accounts. Um, I run the Twitter account, so hopefully... Oh, you should uh, have said that. You're going to get slammed I am now, aren't I? But you know what? <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of military personnel, some serving, some senior officer as well who's serving. We have good debates because it's it's good to have nice friends. Yeah, there's the idiot trolls out there probably had no military service whatsoever. Just ignore them. But it's good to have debates, even on social media, even here, or even on our Facebook pages, because that's how we get things done by talking and debating rather than uh, resulting to fisticuffs. So, uh, yeah, okay. vfpuk.org. And, uh, I'm so, sure vfpuk.org? vfpuk.org. Oh, okay. Next event? Next event, um, well, our, we have two, our, our key thing is our AGM in November over the Remembrance Weekend. We This year we're having a film night on the Friday. And then we have I our think public. I've been invited to I that think by Mr. Have. Griffin. I think you have, sir. Yes, <laughs> um, we could jack you. Hopefully, you can. Uh, yeah. You'll be talking either before or after Q and A. Um, you know, coming to the lion's den. Um, <laughs> no, no, we treat everybody with respect. Um, that's the that's our key thing this year. But we've we've got a calendar on there, which lots of events around the UK. But the key is our AGM. We'll have a public meeting on the uh, on the Saturday where we're going to look about the cost of war, and then the Sunday is when we take part in the remembrance parade. Um, we are usually after the Salvation Army, um, but it's uh, it's always very moving that a lot of people wait there to see us do our bit of commemoration, and it's very moving. The first, it's been very moving every time I've been there, and it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a very moving day. Um, but that's our key focus every year to say that uh, um, yeah, we remember those people who died. Cost of War, ultim- ultimate, lots of people died, and we 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 look at that and remember that that gives us the 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 courage and the conviction and motivates us to do what we're doing and uh, 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 and try to I suppose it's a grandiose aim but bring world peace. I'm out mate we finish. It's been an absolute pleasure, Phil. Thanks a lot, yep. buddy. Good stuff, mate.